the apostle paul having communicated about our life in christ now exhorts us to live according to the new man we have become in christ he describes how living this new creation life affects our speech conduct and attitudes all right we're going to make our declaration this morning and then we will get it um, get into god's words so if you have your bibles please uh, let's turn to matthew the 17th chapter and read verse 20 uh, it's a familiar verse for us matthew 17 and verse 20 the lord jesus said this to his disciples he said jesus said to them because of your unbelief for assuredly i say to you if you have faith as a mustard seed you will say to this mountain move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you the lord jesus uh, taught a lot about faith and how we should exercise faith and one of the things that he spoke and repeated quite often was this he said if you have faith you need to speak it you need to say it and even in his own ministry he demonstrated that you know when people came to him with sickness and disease he didn't say oh god what's happening to them you know he didn't say things like that when people came to him the bible says he would say things like be healed blind eyes see deaf ears open he would speak over them speak words over them In fact the Bible says he cast out spirits with a word. When there was a storm in the sea, he said peace, be still. So he spoke to things, even the inanimate world. He spoke to it. And so Jesus taught us. He said, if you have faith in your heart, then speak. And if you speak that faith, he said you could even move mountains. You will tell the mountain to move, it will move. And he said nothing will be impossible to you. Amen. And that's the words of Jesus. It's not my words, it's not the preacher's words. It's the words of Jesus. So you and I need to believe that and act on it. Well, he told us to do something. Let's do it. He said, if you have faith, you speak to the mountain, tell it to move, it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. So when you're in circumstances and situations where, you know, you want certain things to happen, speak speak to the situation speak to the circumstance speak to your body speak to your finances speak to uh you know whatever the clouds the wind the rain whatever you speak speak into those that environment jesus said you speak nothing will be impossible to you speak in faith so what we're training ourselves to do in making our declaration is that we believe what god has sp- uh spoken concerning us we believe his word so we're going to stand up and we declare now sometimes you know uh uh your body may be having some sickness or disease but you're standing up and saying i've been healed right and uh, sometimes you may be going through some difficult challenges but you might say i'm i'm prosperous i'm triumphant right so you're declaring you're declaring not necessarily what your circumstances are dictating but you're declaring what god has spoken about you into your world. Amen. And Jesus said things in this natural world will respond to those words of faith. So you expect things to change in your life as we make our declaration. So let's stand up to our feet this morning as we hold our Bibles high up in the air. We're going to say what God has said about us. We're going to say it loud, bold and strong. Let's say this together. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing to many people. I receive his word. I believe his word and I live by his word. Christ is my master. And to him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Say hi to the person next to you or behind you or in front of you if you don't know them, give them your name. Say hello. Be please be seated. All right. Ephesians chapter 4. We've been studying the book of Ephesians. uh going through it a uh, little by little uh, every sunday we are going to spend time this uh, this morning on the second part of ephesians 
the fourth chapter, second half of that chapter. Uh, we're going to read verses 17 to 32 and then spend some time talking about it and drawing insights from it, seeing how it impacts our lives. So let's read this passage through Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 32. Paul writes, he says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness." Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now, let's just quickly remind ourselves about the background to this book, Ephesians. Paul has been in Ephesus, this is between AD 58 to about AD 60, has spent three years serving the people there, establishing the church in Ephesus. And many of these people had come from a background of worshipping the goddess Diana, and also many of them had been involved in the occult, witchcraft and so on. So you remember the story in Acts 19 that we read on the very first Sunday, the, the background these people came from. You know, they've been practicing witchcraft and so on. And Paul, during Paul's ministry there, they had a big bonfire. They all, they came and threw in all their, you know, uh, artifacts that they're using and, and their practice is all burnt. So people have come from this kind of a background. And in chapters 1 and chapters 2, chapter 1 and 2, Paul has uh, reminded them of things he has obviously taught them during those three years that he has spent with them. So it's not new to them. He's reminding them of what he has really put into their hearts while he was there for three years. He has taught them about their, he's reminded them about their life in Christ. He says, you know, God chose us in Christ, even before the foundation of the world. God, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We are, uh, cho- we are you know, covered by his love. We are chosen in him. We are covered by his love. We have been redeemed. In, we are redeemed in Christ. We have been predestined in Christ. And then in chapter 2, he talks about the wonderful fact that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's our spiritual life. And that we are, you know, made together as a dwelling place of God. We have been brought near through the blood of Jesus. So all these wonderful things about our life in Christ, he describes in chapters 1 and 2. Wonderful. Chapter 3, he goes a little bit about talking about his ministry, uh, talking about uh, the fact that we need to, you know, understand how great the love of God is, that there is no length, no depth, no height, no measure to the greatness of God's love for us, and that God is able to do wonderful things through us by his power that's at work in us. Chapter 4, he talks a little bit about uh, uh, what Christ has put in the church the fivefold ministry, the fact that all of us have been given gifts, and here are these apostles and prophets and pastors and TV teachers, uh, evangelists given to equip us and, and help us grow into Christ's likeness. And all of that has been spoken. And now he starts talking to them about how you're supposed to live down here on earth. Up there in Christ, wonderful. You're seated with him in heavenly places, you're accepted in the beloved, you're blessed with all the spiritual blessings. All that is wonderful, your, that's your spiritual reality, that's, that's yours in Christ. But let's talk about how you're supposed to walk Sunday to Saturday. 
let's talk about how you're supposed to live your life right here on the earth. And then he begins to say, now I want to tell you something. This I say therefore, that we no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. All right, guys, here comes ground reality. Don't live like the unsaved. Don't live like the people who don't know Jesus. Don't live like the Gentiles. There is a difference in the way we are supposed to live than uh, between us and the way and the people of the world who don't know Christ. This I say therefore, that you no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. And then he gives us five descriptions that describe the state of the unregenerate, the unsaved person. All of us were like that. And this is not in any way to demean them or demean the unsaved person. But it is in order for us to understand why they walk the way they walk. Why they live the way they live. Why is their manner of life? Why is their conduct? Why is their uh, behavior? Why is it that the way they do what they do? So that we understand that we are no longer going to live like them. And he says, first of all, verse 17, they walk in the futility or in the vanity of their minds. That's how they're living. They walk in the vanity of their minds. Their understanding, verse 18, their understanding is darkened. They are alienated from the life of God. They're cut off from the life of God. They're not possessors of the God kind of life. They don't have that. Then they're, they're ignorant of the truth and their hearts are blinded. So because of these five conditions that they are in, they live the way they live. Therefore, he says in verse 19, they have given themselves over. They've gone past all feeling. They, they seem to have no, no more feeling. They've given themselves over to do everything that's unclean and they do it with greediness, meaning there is no end to the way they want, how much of this they do. Just keep on doing all the unclean things. But he says, you are not going to live the way the Gentiles live, the unsaved live. Are you with me? Because they're living in this state. They're living out of the futility of the vain vanity of their mind. They, they are cut off from the life of God. Their understanding is darkened. They're ignorant of the truth and their hearts are blinded. So that's why they live the way they live. But you can't live that. Amen? So now think about this. So some of us, some of the young people here, you're in college and all kinds of things go on in college, right? As soon as they graduate out of 12th, come into first year college, you need a bike, but you also need a girl on the bike. <laughs> so just the bike alone is not enough, right? And all, etc., 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 all kinds of things go on. You get into drinking, smoking, because it's fashionable, you got to be in with the crowd, oh, waste time, you know, going here, going there, all kinds of things. And that's only the beginning. There is no end to that. They work all uncleanness with greediness. They keep on. It's like never satisfied with the, the, the morality and, and, and all the kinds of things they do. Or think about, you know, for those of us who might be working in the corporate world, in the profession, there also you find all kinds of things happening. All kinds. Whether it has to do with the job, whether it has to do with the way people work, all kinds of things. And you, as a believer, are right in the middle of it. But the Bible says, you cannot walk as the others do. You, when you say walk, meaning you can't conduct your life, you can't behave, you can't talk or do the things that they do. Understand that whatever they do, they're doing it because of the vanity of their minds. They don't have the knowledge of the truth. Their hearts are darkened. They are cut off from the life of God. They don't, they're not partakers of the life of God. And their understanding their understanding is dark and they don't, have, they don't have knowledge of the truth. So that's why they do all these things. But you can't do that. So he starts off in verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ. So when you came to Jesus, when you heard the message of Christ, when you embraced this message of Jesus and accepted this invitation to follow Christ, that was not what we told you that life could be a all about. But this is not what you've learned about Jesus. And some of them may have even encountered the ministry of Jesus personally, but 20 years prior to that, to this time. So he says in verse 21, some of you may have heard him personally, but and some of you have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. So this is what you've been taught. What have you been taught? Verses 22, 23, 24. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man 
which was corrupt and kept on growing corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So he says now, put off, that means get rid of your old way, old conduct, your old way of life, which was growing, which kept growing in corrupt. It was just getting worse and worse. And it was a life that was given to deceitful lusts, meaning these cravings, lusts and godly desires were actually deceitful. They told you they'll make you happy. They only made you even more miserable. Deceitful lusts. See, that was our former conduct. We lived like that. We kept on growing in that. But he says, you put it off. Get rid of it. Put it off. You are with me so far? And then he says in verse 24, and we come back to verse 23, you get rid of it, but what do you have to have now? Verse 24, that you put on the new man which is created in the image of God in righteousness and true holiness. So he says, I want you to know something. You've got a new man inside of you. Put on the new man. So you've got a new man inside you. Put him on. Let him become visible in your manner of life, in your conduct, in your behavior, in your actions. Let that new man inside you become visible. And he tells us something about this new man. This new man is created in the image of God. And it is created in righteousness and true holiness. It has this capacity for righteousness and true holiness. Now, for illustration purpose, we can consider our human spirit. So each person here, each one of us, our spirit, soul, and body. Our human spirit can be, just for illustration, can be considered as a container. When I was unsaved, my human spirit had what the Bible calls the old man, which is basically a sinful nature. Or some people use the word Adamic nature, sinful nature, fallen nature, whatever language you want to use. But my spirit contained a sinful nature which, which drove me to do the wrong things I wanted to do. My soul and my body aligned itself and said, okay. And there was no end to the wrong things. But now that I'm born again, that sinful nature is taken out. And my human spirit has now been given the life and the nature of God. All of us who are born again. We have the life and the nature of God. That's why the Bible says, Second Peter 1, 3, we are partakers of the divine nature. Whoever believes in him, First John 5, and whoever believes in him is born of God. You are born of God. God's life and nature is in you. His seed is in you. Are you with me? So that's your new man. The life and the nature of God. The Zoe kind of a life. The God kind of a life is in you. In your human spirit. And that nature, obviously, is in the image of God. And it, is, it has the capacity, or it is, it has the capacity of righteousness and true holiness. That's what it's. Its inclinations are. It drives us. It motivates us for righteousness and true holiness. That's the new man inside you. So all of us as believers, we are partakers of divine nature. We have the life and nature of God in our human spirit. And we have the capacity to walk in righteousness and true holiness. Are you with me so far? It's in all of us. We're born again. New creation. New man. The nature of God in you. But, he says, you got to do something. Worse. 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. There it is. Verse 22 says, put off the old man. Verse 24 says, put on the new man. But in between, I need to do something. I need to be renewed in the spirit of my mind. The attitude, the very essence of my mind. Why? Because when I was living in my old way of life, he just told me in verse 17, I was living by the futility of my my, my understanding was dark and I didn't know the truth. I was ignorant of the truth. My heart was darkened. But now that I am in Christ and I've been born again, I have the life of the nature of God. I'm no longer ignorant of the truth. I'm no longer ignorant of, uh, of, of, of the ways of God. My heart has been enlightened. My eyes have been enlightened. I have the new man inside me. But I need to renew my minds. This is exactly what Paul writes to the church in Rome. In Romans chapter 12 verses 1, 2 and 3. He says, I beseech you therefore brethren, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. And do not be conformed to this world. Same as verse 22. Put off the old man. But be transformed. Same as verse 24. Put on the new man. How? By the renewing of your minds. Same as verse 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your. 
So for all of us believers, we are born again. We have the life and the nature of God inside of us. We have the God kind of a life. We are partakers of the divine nature. In our spirit, we are connected with Jesus Christ. We are joined together with him. We are seated with him in heavenly realms. The Holy Spirit inhabits us. So in our spirit, there is so much. Uh, you know, We are in the image of God. We have the capacity for righteousness and true holiness. But there are two things that we must do. We need to renew our mind and we need to present our bodies as a living only then can we put on the new man. That means what's on the inside can now be visible on the outside. And people say, oh, you know, suppose you buy a new shirt and trouser and you go to school, college, or place of work. Hey, new shirt, man. You've got something new on. Now, in our lifestyle, in our behavior, in our conduct, in our speech, put on the new man. Hey, what happens? Something's changed. Now, true, when we are born again, that change comes instantaneously. God does that work in our spirit. But he wants our cooperation to change our mind and to work upon our body. So that the new man can now become visible on the outside. Amen? So that's why it's so important to read the Bible. That's why it's so important to, you know, hear the teaching of God's word. Why? Through the teaching of the word of God, through the word of God, our minds are renewed. I no longer, my, my mind moves from being one that was vain in its thinking, futile in its thinking, its thought process. And it comes to something that's more aligned to the ways and thoughts of God. I begin to think the way God wants me to think. I begin to look at life and look at circumstances, situations in life the way God wants me to think. And my body, I'm able to offer it as a living sacrifice with the help of the Holy Spirit. He crucifies uh, all the sinful deeds of the body. So that's why I need the Word of God. And I need the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, how is this, what is this putting on this new man? Paul begins to explain to us now in verse 25. What does it mean to put on the new man? Well, it comes down to these kinds of things. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one end. So putting on the new man. It comes down to these practical things. Get rid of lying. Now, what do you say? Speak the truth. That's expression. Of the new creation man. The new man. Comes down to that. Are you with me? The new man. Here he says. You put away lying. That's part of this new man. Being put on. Speak the truth. Then he says. Next verse. Be angry. And do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. That means. You have a righteous indignation. Towards things that are wrong. Be angry about it. But in your anger. You're not going to do something. But you're angry. And therefore you're. Indignation towards what is wrong holds you back from sin. But settle the matter before the day is over. Don't let the sun go down being angry. Just settle it. So we have to have that kind of an indignation, righteous anger towards unrighteous things. And then he says in the next verse, verse 27, And give no place to the devil. Now, think about this. He has already told you and me, we are seated in heavenly places. At the Father's right hand, and that's in chapter 2. And all the devils are underneath our feet. We are seated on the highest throne. And every principality, power, dominion, might is underneath our feet. Positionally, that's where you and I are as believers. But practically, verse 27, give no place to the... So in day-to-day life, when you're here on earth, it's your responsibility and mine to make sure we give no place to the... Now, don't just say, well, I'm seated at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. (laughs) Go to sleep. (laughs) The devil will not do anything to me. It is true. In the spirit, you are at the right hand of God. You are in Christ Jesus. But in everyday life, living here on earth, he says, it's your responsibility and mine not to give any place to the devil. Don't give the devil any opportunity to enter your world, your life. That's your responsibility. Now, think about this. Jesus Christ on the cross defeated the devil. The Bible says, in fact, that he destroyed the one who had the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus triumphed with the devil. He gained victory for you and me. But he's asking you and me to do something. He says, now you make sure you don't give the devil any entrance into your... James chapter 3 verse 16 is quite an insightful verse. It says, where there is jealousy and where there is selfish ambition... There is confusion and every evil work. So two things. 
jealousy and selfish ambition opens the door it's like please come and devil i'm bring everyone else with you <laughs> where there is jealousy and selfish ambition there is confusion and not just confusion every evil work it's like we're giving an open door for all the devils please come so if i want to keep the devil out i got to keep jealousy and selfish ambition so he stole us in his word are you listening so it's my responsibility to make sure i keep the devil out give no place to the devil so here's the point the point is if i do not walk according to my new man but if i continue walking according to the old man one of the consequences will be that i will end up giving place to the so that is why sometimes even believers are facing all this stuff because although we are born again we have the life and the nature of god in our spirit and we are supposed to live according to the new man if we continue our conduct and our behavior according to the former ways what is going to happen i'm going to give room to the devil he's going to come in happily and accommodate you know create confusion every evil work in my world i have the responsibility to keeping that door closed by living according to the new man still with me and then he continues more about living what does it mean to live according to the new man verse 28 let him him who stole steal no longer but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give to him who has need so before you came to know christ he says example here before you came to know christ maybe you were stealing and all doing all the wrong things but now now that you're a believer you stop that do what is honorable you work with your own hands so that you can have have your needs met and have things enough to give to others so don't continue doing the wrong thing that was there in your former way of life transformation you're starting to live according to the new man verse 29 let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearer so now again change in your speech so there is a change in your conduct your way your behavior now there's also a change in your speech don't let corrupt words come out of your mouth but let words that edify and bring grace words that build up and words that impart grace bring grace in people's lives speak that way that's an expression of the new man still with me so it's a choice we make as i renew my mind and yield my body to the holy spirit offer it as a living sacrifice there's a change in my speech as well i try to speak words that build people up that that encourage people and and build them up speak words that are positive strengthen them and bring grace bring the empowering of god into their lives you know and this is so important in, in homes and families as parents the way you speak to your children as uh, as a husband wives as we speak to uh, uh, speak to your spouse speak to each other or even in the church as we speak to one another speak words that edify and speak words that bring grace build each other up that way so even if somebody does something wrong learn to speak in a way that will still build them up and bring grace Don't say ah oh, man you're a fool man. <laughs> you know, don't speak things that tear them down even if they do something wrong. You know, we got to have some wisdom where and if you if you don't know how to do it just ask the lord you know, I know this this is a difficult situation I know how to deal with it I know how to speak the truth I would tell them what's right what's wrong but just help me to speak it with grace in a way that will edify and not tear down especially when you're dealing with our own with children I know Uh, teenage children growing up they'll experiment do lots of different things and you can't be hitting them on the head you know that's you you'll make chapati out of them <laughs> no you don't want to destroy them of course they're going to experiment of course they're going to do you know silly things that uh, may not be right but you know you bring correction but bring it in love bring it in a way that will build them up bring it in a way that will still impart grace to them amen and that's the new man he says that's you living according to your new man and then he says in verse 30 and do not grieve the holy spirit of god by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption so here's the second thing if i do not live according to the new man i will end up grieving the holy so there are two consequences here in this whole passage if i as a believer although i am a new creation inside me if i don't live according to this new man and if i just continue living the way i was living two consequences one i'm going to end up giving place to the devil and second i'm going to end up grieving the holy 
Yes, he's in me. Yes, I am sealed for the day of redemption. All that's wonderful. But I'm going to grieve him if I continue living according to my former way of life. Grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, there's, uh, there are many different symbols for the Holy Spirit. But one of those symbols is that of a dove. The dove is very gentle. Of course, I know, the, you know, the, the mighty wind is also a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is powerful. I'm not saying he's as weak as a dove. He is as gentle as a... So, the dove. The dove is also very sensitive, in a good sense. You know, not, not a bad sense. In a good sense, meaning if you, you know, if, if, if you shake and make a little noise, you just fly away. The dove does not eat junk. Doesn't eat junk. So, some things about the Holy Spirit. He's gentle. He's sensitive. And he doesn't want to mix around with the dirt. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. How would I grieve him? If I continue walking according to my former way of? life. If I lie, if I, my conduct is not in alignment to the new man, example, if I used to steal, I continue stealing, I'm going to grieve the Holy Spirit. Or if I'm speaking corrupt words, words that don't edify, don't bring grace to people, I would grieve the Holy. So it says, don't do that. And then last two verses, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, clamor is all this quarreling, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ's sake has forgiven you. Notice he says, you know, I want you to get rid of all these things. Bitterness, being quarrelsome. I mean, you can have discussions and arguments and all. I mean, things like that. Of course, you're, when you're talking about quarreling, bitterness, anger, clamor, evil speaking of. Get rid of all these things because these do not align to the new man. They're not part of this new man. Now, let me talk a little bit about two, two things that I want to highlight from verse 31, 32. 31, he says, let all bitterness. Now, bitterness is a serious issue. I want to spend a little bit of time on that. It usually, bitterness usually starts off with offense. You get offended. Sometimes it could be totally unintentional. Sometimes, you know, yes, there are people who offend you. You know, maybe your boss is trying to cut you down. Maybe there are colleagues in the workplace who uh, cut you off. I mean, so, sometimes it could be very intentional. People are trying to, you know, do things against you. They offend you. Sometimes it could be totally unintentional. Example, pastor is busy. He's thinking about, you know, something else. He's walking out. Then he didn't say, he didn't smile at me. Hmm. <laughs> he get offended. <laughs> hey, poor fellow. He's just, he's minding his own business. He's on his way out. And you get offended. You know, some, that is, you know, sometimes things, unintentional things could also offend us. But the point is this. We, we, can all, we all face offense. He said offenses will come. So it will come. But the point is, every time you feel offended about something, you and I have the choice to quickly forgive. Just release it. And forgiveness does not demand something from the other side. Stephen was being stoned. He didn't throw back the stones and then said, I'll forgive you. <laughs> he didn't know that. He was being stoned and he said, Father... Do not lay this sin to their charge. Jesus being crucified. He didn't bash them all up and then said, I forgive you. No. He said, Father, forgive them. Regardless of whether they change or not, my heart is, I'll forgive. Finished. So that's the antidote to offense. Offense will come. It will come and it will keep on coming. As long as we are on this earth, people will be doing, saying things against us. Or sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. That offend us. It hurts us. Offense means it's a hurt. You feel the pain of it. Yes, of course you feel it. But I have a choice. I have a choice to be kind and to forgive as God in Christ forgave me. I forgive. I get rid of the offense. But now, if I don't deal with the offense and let the offense stay in my heart... It's going to grow up into something that's called bitterness. Sound doesn't even sound good. <laughs> it's going to grow up into bitterness. And we can get bitter with people. Uh, we can get bitter with institutions. Some people are bitter against the church. The church let me down or church didn't do this for me or whatever. So we can get bitter against people. We can get bitter against institutions. And sad to say, sometimes people also get bitter towards God. Why did he let this happen to me? If God was such a good God or God is such a great God and he didn't answer this prayer or he didn't do this for me, he didn't do that for me. And bitterness comes in the hearts of people towards God. But I want us to understand the seriousness of bitterness. In Hebrews 12, if you want to, you could turn there. In Hebrews 12, Paul uh, writes something there in Hebrews 12 verse 15. 
He says, looking carefully or be careful about this. Hebrews 12, 15. Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this many become. That's kind of serious there because he's talking about falling short of the grace of God. Meaning from God's side, he's reaching out to you with his grace. But somehow you're falling short of receiving that grace. So be careful lest you fall short of the grace of God. Meaning, God's grace is coming to you, but you're just not able to receive it. You're falling short of it. Why? Lest any bitterness spring up, cause trouble, means it's troubling you, and defiles many others. So bitterness is such a serious thing. It can actually reach a point in people's lives where they are unable to receive the grace that God is releasing to them. They fall short of the grace of? Are you understanding that? You know, sometimes you meet people where they are so angry with God, so upset with God, they say, I'll never have anything to do with God. And you're like, you know, they're in that place where they're just absolutely cut off, never have anything to do with God. They fall short of the grace. It's not that God's grace is not there. There's abundant grace. But because of that bitterness in their heart, they're not able to receive that grace. I'm not saying they cannot be reached, but it's going to take a little bit of effort in trying to deal with that bitterness and help them break out of that. But that's the danger of bitterness. It causes us to fall short of the grace of God and it troubles us, troubles the person carrying bitterness. And if it continues to grow, it will affect others. So going back to Ephesians 4.31, let us get rid of all bitterness. The best way is the moment you're offended, you will get offended by whatever things. The moment you're offended, you say, God, I just extend forgiveness. It's not dependent on whether that person changes. But as God in Christ forgave me, I am going to. You dealt with the offense. There's no chance of that offense becoming bitterness. Amen. And I just want to highlight the importance of forgiveness. James 5, again, very familiar verse. Um, He says this, verse 16. Confess your faults to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. So relationships, important. Confess your, hey, I'm sorry. Saying sorry is a good thing. I've done this to you or I was too rude to you or what? I'm sorry. Confess your, I did this. Confess your faults. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. But acknowledge it. Confess your, confess your faults to one another. I mean, you don't have to go and tell everybody what's wrong. You talk, talk to the person whom you offended. You know, The person you offended. Confess. Confess your faults. Heal. Restore that relationship. Confess your faults to one another. Pray for one another. What will happen? You will be healed. Healing is, is at the end of that whole exercise or transaction or relational healing. So imagine, for some of us, the pathway to physical healing is first relational healing. Confess your faults. Pray for the person who's been offended. Pray and you will be. And after that, you will have powerful prayer life. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person avails. So this righteous person is a person who's dealt with that fact that he's got his relationships right. It's a prerequisite there in James 5.16. I know positionally we are righteous in Christ, but practically saying, take care of your relationships. Broken relationships can hinder our prayer life as well. Are you with me so far? So, what did we learn this morning as we close? The way we live, the way we conduct ourselves is going to be, is, has to be, will be different from the way the Gentiles walk, the unsaved walk. They do whatever they do because of, you know, all these different, the state in which they are. Each one of us have a new man. We have the capacity to walk in righteousness and true holiness. All of us can do that. It's in you. But... I've got to be renewed in the spirit of my mind. I've got to renew my mind to the truth of God's word. And I'd offer my body as a living sacrifice. Let the Holy Spirit do his work there. We'll talk more about that in chapter 5 as we get into chapter 5. And part of that new man being put on, being seen, being made visible through my speech and conduct. It has to be visible through my speech and my conduct. It means the words I speak have to be words of grace, words of life, words that build up. It means my conduct changes. I stop doing the wrong things in the past and I, and I walk different. I live differently. It also means the attitudes of my heart. I get rid of bitterness and unforgiveness. Amen? That's living this new creation life. 
that's putting on the new man that's where the rubber meets the road you are still seated in heavenly places enjoy the view but down here on earth people can only see what comes out of your mouth in the life you live amen and that needs to reveal jesus christ let's stand to our feet please as we get ready to close this morning going to take a few moments just to pray i call our worship team up let's take some time just to pray and i'm sure all of us will have something to pray about this morning things in our life that is not aligned to the new man whatever it could be let's pray and say god i want the truth of your word to change my thinking in this area so that my conduct my speech my behavior my manner of life will be an expression of this nature of god that's in me some of us may have to deal with this hard attitudes that he spoke about bitterness unforgiveness evil speaking and things like that just take it to the lord say this morning god i really want the life and the nature of god in me to come forth please forgive me please change me there has to be a change in our thinking and also there's something that needs to be crucified in the flesh in my body just invite the holy spirit to deal with that let's take a few moments here just to pray just let just between you and the lord you engage with the lord as the worship team leads us for a few moments
Father, we just pray that this new man that you have put in our spirits, that's created in the image of God and righteousness and true holiness, the life, the nature of God that you put inside of us, will truly, Lord, be made visible on the outside, that we will be able to put on the new man. And God, whatever is causing the wrong kind of behavior, the wrong kind of conduct, the wrong kind of speech, the wrong kind of attitudes to continue, whether it's in our soul or in our body, oh God, we pray you will break it. Change our thinking. Help us, Lord, to put an end to the deeds of our body. Dismantle, Lord, wrong thinking. And even the roots of bitterness, or roots of anger, roots of evil speaking, God, take it out so that this beautiful new man that you've placed inside each of us, oh God, will be made visible on the outside. That Christ will be seen. That God, relationships in our homes, in our families, in our marriages, and the way we relate to people, and the way we relate to uh, people in our workplaces and outside, God, will be so transformed by this new man that you've put in us. Today, God, this very moment, by your Spirit, uproot things. Take them out by the roots. By the roots, Lord. Take it out of our hearts. Take it out of our minds, our souls. Approve things that should not be there. Right now, by your spirit, let there be a total transformation. Let there be a total change because of the power of the new creation. Because of the power of your Holy Spirit, the power of your word, that is truth. I want to encourage us also that, you know, in case you feel that something is not right with somebody, maybe in church or outside, go make it right. Can we do that? And it's not dependent on their action. They may accept, they may not accept, that's not in our control. But at least we can do our part of making it right either saying I'm sorry or um, I forgive you if I'm the one who did the wrong thing I say I'm sorry if they're the one who did the wrong thing I say I forgive you can we do that because the Bible tells us that if we take care of that relationship healing comes and it brings us into a place of powerful prayer things can happen when we pray Amen. So maybe if the people right here in church, if you need to get it right, get it right. People at home or family or outside, do you, do whatever you can. Do what you can. We can't dictate the response, but at least we can do our part and say, "I forgive, I release, I love." My heart should be clear. So Father, we just pray you'll give us the grace to do that, God. Even as your word says. To confess our faults to one another. To pray for one another. That we may be healed. And even if there is one person in our lives that we need to get right with. Oh God, give us the grace. Help us to do it. Just to release forgiveness. Or to ask for forgiveness. Give us the grace to do it. Let me just thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's close, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each one of us always. Amen. Amen. Are you all happy you came today? Oh, no, no, no. 
God bless you guys. Have a good afternoon. Enjoy your Sunday. See you again. God bless. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.